Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Digestion Diaries. I'm Dr. Jason Pikin, and what we're gonna be talking about today is the ketogenic diet. I know I've mentioned the ketogenic diet in a bunch of other episodes, but I'm on it again currently, and I have a lot of patients asking me exactly what I'm doing, and they're asking me more detailed questions than ever, because the ketogenic diet is becoming popular, and I've been using it more in practice because I've seen a lot of the benefits for it. So what I'm gonna do is give a summary of not everything I know, but a big uh, general overview of what the ketogenic diet is and how to get into it and how do you know you're into it, all that. So let's just start with question number one that you'll see me glance over at. What is it? Well, first of all, let's just talk about fuel. Normally, what our bodies crave is to use glucose, sugar, as our primary source of fuel. And so what we do in especially modern life is we eat probably more glucose, more sugar, more starches, more carbohydrates than we really need to survive, mainly because food tastes freaking good. And we're, it's easily available to us. I live in, uh, well, I practice in New York City. I live in Northern Westchester, New York, and food's just everywhere. It's easy to get. And when you start to enjoy food, you most likely starting to enjoy the, the flavors and the textures and the fullness you get and the satisfaction you get from carbohydrates. But the truth is, if you take in more carbohydrates than you actually need, which is a very small amount. What happens is to those extra carbohydrates that you can't burn off unless you're hunting all day or foraging for your food and you're spending all day outside and active, unless you're doing that, which most of my patients and myself isn't doing, I find myself in an office moving throughout the day, but not vigorously, except when I'm exercising, and most of the patients I take care of are sitting on their butts, not burning off those carbohydrates and those calories they're that they're taking in. So what happens with all of these extra calories from carbohydrate is they have to get utilized by the body. And there's this hormone called insulin, and one of the many things insulin does is it drives that sugar, that starch gets converted into sugar, the carbohydrates that you eat get converted into sugar, and then that gets shoved into your blood cells and your cells so you can use them for energy. But once your cells are, let's say, full, well then a lot of that gets converted to fat. And this is the biggest reason why Many of my patients, many of you watching, many of the people that you know in especially America are overweight and they have trouble losing that fat. It's because they eat more carbohydrates than needed. Now, technically, the actual requirement for carbohydrates in our bodies in order for us to survive is nothing. We don't actually need carbohydrates, yet they're an easily accessible source of fuel that we can utilize for energy. So I don't say they're evil, we're just gonna be talking about this in reference to the ketogenic diet. So let's say you wanna stop this excess carbohydrate loading and you wanna get off of using glucose as your major source of energy. Well then, you'd look for an alternative source of energy which happens to be conveniently already built within us, the ketone producing system or starting a ketogenic diet, living a ketogenic lifestyle, and your body will start to create ketones as an alternative source of energy rather than using glucose as your source of energy. It's simple. The difference between the ketogenic diet and the paleo diet or the watermelon diet or uh, whatever you want to call it is the mindset that we're not just doing this to lose weight. We're not just eating this and don't eating this. It's not a food elimination reintroduction diet, although I'll get into that. It's a change in your metabolism. We're shifting your metabolism from going from a sugar energy user into a ketone energy user. And this system is actually, again, already within our body. 50,000 years ago, if you woke up and you didn't have any food left from the yesterday's hunt or gather, and it was kind of a crappy weather outside and you couldn't find any food close, and you went for two or three days without any food, what your body would do is it would start producing ketones 
from your liver, from the stores of fat that you have in your body. You become a, a fat burning machine, basically, and this is where our stores of energy get utilized for good. Now, throughout the day, anytime you get really exhausted from carbohydrates, you can, you may not produce ketones, but you will be starting to utilize fat as your source of energy, and ketones is one of the drivers of that. So what we want to do with the ketogenic diet is live in a state where we're using ketone as a source of energy on a regular basis, most of the time. We're not going to be 100% uh, using ketones as our source of energy. We're always going to produce a little glucose. Even if you eat zero carbohydrates, your body is going to do something, a process called gluconeogenesis, just to create a little bit of sugar. But what we're after is using ketones as our primary source of energy. So why do it? Why do the ketogenic diet in the first place? Well, first I have to tell you my story about why I'm going to do it or why I went back to it. The ketogenic diet is one of my favorite elimination reintroduction diets. What that means is you're spending a period of time eating from a certain diet plan. Now that certain diet plan could be a certain short list of foods that you eat to see if you're allergic to them or not. Um, it could be a, a plan that um, once that gets you to change your blood sugar, uh, a plan that you want to just see if you're less bloated with. But basically the ketogenic diet is a very restrictive diet compared to most diets out there. There are a lot of foods that I can't eat or if I can eat them on this diet, I can only eat very small quantities, so it's a very different than my normal diet, which tends to be more paleo-based or just really healthy. It tends to be paleo-mediterranean, if you want to name it something. But the keto diet is very different, so it works as a good elimination, reintroduction. And that's why I'm doing it, to see how I feel. I always want to challenge what I'm eating to see if what I'm eating is serving me properly. Do I feel different? Do I feel less inflammation, less bloating? Does my body fat go down? Do I have better energy, better sleep, less anxiety? I want to know these things and I want to know how food plays a part in all these questions that I have. So I choose a diet every once in a while to follow for a few weeks or a few months and I, I see how I like it. Now there are other reasons why someone would choose the ketogenic diet and the biggest one out there on the internet is weight loss. The vast majority of time if we keep carbohydrates low and the ketogenic diet is one of the lowest carbohydrate diets out there, you will just in fact lose weight. Even if you don't try to, even if you eat too many calories, you're still likely, not definitely, going to lose weight. And that's why people do it. But there are other benefits to the ketogenic diet. One is that you're increasing insulin sensitivity. Diabetes is rampant in the United States. It's estimated that about a third of the population is, if not already diagnosed with diabetes, then they have diabetes and they aren't aware of it because they haven't been checked by their doctor, haven't had a great blood test. Then there is another group of people, with it, which is another 20-30%, which is pre-diabetic in some way or on the road to diabetes based upon their lifestyle, based upon high stress, high sugar, high carbs, their family history. and so. The ketogenic diet is a great shift away from carbohydrates and again glucose as your source of fuel and a great shift away from that path of diabetes. The ketogenic diet tends to be anti-inflammatory for a lot of people because of that. See, insulin is a hormone that is released by our pancreas when we want to deal with sugar and deal with carbohydrates, drive them into our tissues. but insulin has another effect. Insulin is also pro-inflammatory. And I won't get into the details of that. I'm actually going to hopefully film another video right after this one that's going to explain that further, but let's stick to keto. So what we have is increased insulin sensitivity, in, <laughs> increased insulin sensitivity, weight loss, fat loss, and increased muscle building, increased energy, mind clarity, so many things go along with it and so I recommend it as something you can try 
Again, if you're unsure about your overall health status and whether you should be doing this on your own, consult a doctor first. You should never just jump into a diet because you saw me making a video on the internet or somebody else's video. You should make sure it's right for you by speaking to your doctor. Right? So let's go on to the next. I'm going through this list over here. Why do it? And first, it's a great elimination reintroduction, metabolic, uh, decreases pain and inflammation because of the insulin effect, uh, increases insulin sensitivity. So if you're on the road towards diabetes, one of the biggest drivers of diabetes is something called insulin resistance. What that means is you're eating so many carbs on a regular basis or you have a lot of stress that raises your um, or decreases your insulin sensitivity that your body keeps releasing insulin all the time and your cells say, I don't care. I've seen this insulin. I see it every single second of the day. I don't even know what to do with all this insulin anymore. And the cells just stop listening. They stop utilizing insulin and that means your pancreas has to work harder at producing more and more and more and more insulin. And this cycle goes on and on until either the pancreas fails, your cells are so resistant that they don't even care about insulin anymore, and you wind up diabetic. And that's what we're trying to avoid. Another benefit of doing something like the ketogenic diet, simply to challenge yourself. That's one of the reasons why I also did it for January of 2019. I just needed a challenge. In general, I lead a very healthy life and my general diet, even when I'm not following anything, is just incredibly great without any rules. But I found myself starting in November, that holiday time came around, slipping a little bit because I didn't have any rules in my life. And I knew that when I challenge myself to do something really strict, for one, it'll make some changes temporarily in my life and I'll learn even more when I reintroduce a normal diet or my typical healthy diet back into my life. But what I wanted to do is challenge myself with something that I would consider a little bit difficult, something that I don't like, something that's tough because if after that you go into a less restrictive diet, it's easy. Now, you don't have to go from keto into eating tons of cookies and cakes and chocolate shakes, but if you go from keto into paleo, or if you go from keto into the Mediterranean lifestyle, and you wanna just get rid of artificial sweeteners, tons of carbs in your life, you wanna minimize them, well then, after spending a few weeks on keto, it's easy. And that's a way to do it, a reason to do it all on its own. And ultimately also what I recommend ketogenic diets for is to change your relationship with food. So many people that I see in practice are addicted to carbohydrates and sugars. They, for two reasons, and I'll get into this in that next video I'm gonna make about cortisol and insulin and sugar, you'll see it soon. But what I wanna teach people is that they don't have to rely on these foods because they're craving them. They're craving them because of conditioning when they were a little kid, they got an ice cream cone when they wanted to, their parents wanted them to feel good, and because when you're stressed, if you feed yourself carbs, it reduces that stress temporarily, but almost instantaneously. And if you really wanna change that relationship you have with food, the ketogenic diet, which is extremely low carbohydrate, is a great tool to do that with. All right, let's go into the next thing. How long until I'm in, a, in ketosis uh, after using a ketogenic diet? Well, first, that, I just gotta say that varies. It depends on the person, it depends on your metabolism, it depends on how many times you've done low carbohydrate diets in the past. But what I'll say is the minimum of three to five days to get into that ketosis, and for some people, it can take two, three, let's say even four weeks for some, but on that longer end, that's gonna be pretty rare. And what I'd re recommend is if you don't start to feel the differences from a ketogenic diet within the first week, then you have to start to measure. And so here's what you have to measure. First, macros, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. So it's either 70, 80, or even up to 90% fat in some cases, depending on the therapeutic effects you want. But let's say for the most common trend, it should be 70%. 
and we want to keep it a 70% fat diet. That means that other 30% is going to be split between proteins and carbohydrates. Generally, I recommend that you start with about 50 grams of carbohydrates a day. Now, that's net carbohydrates and net carbohydrates means you look at the carbohydrates on the package of food that you're about to eat or if you don't have a package if you're eating fresh vegetables like I recommend then there are simple really easy keto apps out there or you can just google how many carbs I'm, I'm talking into my phone that's what this means um, how many carbs in a cup full of broccoli and you'll get that from Google you, you have so much information out there to figure out how many carbs there are, but basically the net carbs is how many carbs are in that thing you want to eat minus the amount of fiber in that thing you want to eat. And it's an easy calculation. So throughout an entire day of food, what you want to make sure is that you're not going over 50 for the total grams of carbohydrates. Now, some people can get away with more carbohydrates, depends on your size. Some people really need to be restrictive and keep it under 20 carbohydrates. But that's between you and a health practitioner. I think a good safe place to start is 50 grams for most people. And then we play with it based upon your results. Let's move into macros. So what do you have to measure is if you're not getting results in that first week, you have to measure, are you getting enough calories from fat? Are you eating too much protein? Uh, if, you if you're used to having healthy uh, chicken breast or uh, a lean piece of steak, well, that's a lot of protein and there may not be enough calories from fat and it may keep you from going into ketosis. Another thing that you can measure is ketones that you're producing in your body. And I'll go through the three most common. One, there's the keto urine strips. Now, the keto urine strips are, a, are the least accurate way of measuring ketosis, but they're a really great tool in the beginning of your keto journey. You see, for the most part, if you're living a general lifestyle where you're having more than 50 or 75 or 100 grams of carbohydrates in your day, and you're not eating a lot of fat, and you're not fasting a lot, we'll get into that, then you're probably not producing many or any ketones at all. So when you first start to produce ketones from your liver, your body doesn't even know what to do with them. And the excess ketones that you're using, that you're producing, will wind up in your urine. And all you have to do is grab one of these ketone um, urine strips and pee on it. Plus, there are six, seven dollars on Amazon. You can find them from a bunch of different companies out there. I'm not going to recommend one over another. And in the beginning stages of ketosis, within the first couple weeks, you're probably going to notice that when you urinate on one of these strips, it'll turn a dark purple. At least that's the company I use as their color. And that means that you're producing ketones. Now, that doesn't mean you're utilizing those ketones, or it doesn't tell you how you're utilizing these ketones. And once you start getting used to using those ketones as fuel, the spillover into your urine will decrease. And so the ketone strips, urine strips, won't be as accurate as time goes on. So great initial tool, not fantastic long-term. What's better long-term is measuring acetone. Acetone is another basically like byproduct alcohol from ketosis and you'll breathe it out. Some people say they have like a sweet tasting breath when they're on ketosis, uh, when they're in ketosis or on a ketogenic diet. Some people think it's a bad smell and um, that's just up to the, the user, but there are meters that you can buy that measure ketones in your breath. They're uh, one of the ones that I plan on using during this round and I'm gonna be using it starting next week when I get it in, is a simple alcohol meter, an inexpensive one. What you don't want is one of the really expensive ones because those are measuring exact alcohol from drinks. But if you get the inexpensive ones, they can't differentiate between alcohol from drinks and acetone. So for 10, 15, 20, 30 dollars max, you can buy a breath alcohol meter that measures whether you're in ketosis or not. The most accurate is the blood version. So you test your blood with a blood meter, just similar to how diabetics can test their glucose. You can take a simple drop of blood and measure your ketone levels. Now, I 
particularly hate taking blood on a regular basis, especially poking my fingertip. It just doesn't make me happy. So I'm not going to do the blood meter. And I actually know when I'm in ketosis by feel, by my body fat levels, by the level of bloat, and sometimes through the urine. But there, most people don't actually even need to measure if you're seeing results. Now, this is the key point that I want to state again. It's nice to measure. I recommend people in the initial stages of going into ketosis, of wondering whether they're in ketosis, I recommend you measuring through urine strips to, me to measure whether you're even creating ketones. And maybe a breath meter and a blood meter if you really want to. But for me, I actually feel different when I'm generating ketones and my body shape changes. So if you're getting results from living on this diet, that's good enough for me. Now, if you're not getting results, that's when measurement is even more important. Okay, so there's my thing about measuring macros and uh, ketones. How will I feel on a ketogenic diet? Really, everybody feels different. I don't feel drastically different from my normal life because in general, I feel a little, I feel really good. Uh, but the worse you feel in your regular life, the more inflamed and fat and bloated and horrible and low energy you feel, the more likely you are to feel the opposite of those things. So it's really up to you. What do I eat? I could go on forever saying what to eat. So I'm going to skip that and save it for the internet. There are so many sites out there that give you full keto plans. Uh, if you just Google ketogenic diet, you're going to get 17,000 recipes. So I don't think this is the spot for it. But in general, if it has fat, you can eat it as long as it's a healthier fat. You know what, I'm already diving down that rabbit hole. So let's leave that to the internet and I'm gonna have some links under this video of the, th of the people I recommend that you get that information from. And what sweeteners, here's, let's get into some issues that people have when they're going into a ketogenic diet. Well, I, 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 Jason, I, Dr. Pike, and whatever you wanna call me, I need some sweet, some semblance of sweet, and the sweet has a lot of carbs in it, and I don't know what to do. So one thing you can have is stevia in small amounts. I use something called Lily's Dark Chocolate, and again, you can't use a lot of it, but you break off a couple squares. It's made with stevia instead of sugar. It's really dark chocolate. It doesn't have any milk in it, and it's a great source of sweet. I love using low hung wo fruit or monk fruit. Those are both like different names for the same thing, which has almost a negligible carbohydrate count in it. And I also recommend using D-ribose. D-ribose is an alternate sugar that you can use. Tastes really sweet. And you can get like a 100% piece of dark chocolate, which is almost inedible, it's so bitter. Um, uh, melt it in the microwave for a couple seconds just to see a little meltiness of it, and then sprinkle a little D-ribose on it. Again, there isn't any sweetener that I want you using a lot of, but just to get that little bit of sweet palate, D-ribose, monk fruit, stevia are all great things to add into your diet to keep yourself happy. So veggies, here's a big problem that people experience on in ketosis they don't get enough fiber we still need some fiber in our life and we still need all the uh, the magnesium the calcium the, the the vitamins and minerals from vegetables in our diet and because our vegetables actually have carbohydrates in them i know some people out there know this but a lot of people that talk to me in my office don't realize that vegetables and fruits are carbohydrates pr primarily Yet, if they're high water vegetables, they have very low carbohydrates. And so here's some ideas of high water vegetables, mainly the, the cruciferous vegetables, which is the cabbage family. Cabbage itself is fantastic. Broccoli, cauliflower, bok choy is another one. I don't think in the cabbage family. Sorry if I made a mistake there. Asparagus, cucumbers, which are technically not a vegetable, they're a fruit because they have seeds, very low carbohydrate. And basically what you wanna do is again, Google this on the internet, find the net carbs, it's really easy. But what a high water vegetable means is, if you were to run it through a juicer, if you were to smash it up in a, in a bag, how much liquid would get released? So, carrots, 
release a decent amount of water, but they're a little starchy after you cook them, but they're a decent high water vegetable. Look up net carbs easily on Google. Um, uh, but broccoli, if you juice it, it's just gonna release a lot of water. Lettuces, iceberg lettuce, um, a romaine lettuce, um, spinach, they're gonna release a lot of water. And so use these water-filled lettuce-like vegetables to get your veggies in so you're not getting unhealthy, uh, you're not gonna become unhealthy on the ketogenic diet. All right, fruit. Fruit is basically, I'm not gonna say a no-no, you can have whatever you want on the ketogenic diet, but the carbohydrate count from fruit adds up quickly, especially in something, again, starchy, like a banana, compared to something like a strawberry. A uh, strawberry is not gonna have a lot of starch to it, but a banana is. So if you're gonna have fruit, low amounts, and count your carbs. Adding fat, so a great trick for making sure if you're looking at a meal and you're wondering because you got it out and you didn't want to measure everything, hey, does this have enough fat in it to meet my ketogenic needs for the day? Well, you can always add MCT oil, medium chain triglyceride oil. Um, it, it typically comes from a coconut base, so if you're allergic to coconut, maybe you need to think twice. You can also use olive oil, a high quality extra virgin olive oil, an avocado oil, walnut oil. These are all things that you can add in after something's cooked. You don't want to cook with them. Well, you can cook with olive oil, sorry. But you want to add these things on after your meal is already prepared just to make sure you've upped your calories from fat during that meal. And again, you're not losing weight, you're not feeling great, you're feeling bloated, maybe you added too much fat, speak to your health practitioner. And here's another mistake that people make on the ketogenic diet, they don't pay any attention to calories. Now personally, I don't, personally, because I'm not trying to lose weight. The vast majority of people actually will lose weight despite not counting calories, because you definitely feel more full, satisfied more easily on a ketogenic diet, and you don't feel as bloated, you don't hold on to much water. So the vast majority of weight change happens within the first few days to a week, where you lose a lot of water weight, that excess water weight, you hold on to the water you need. You might wind up being a lot more thirsty on ketogenic diet, that's okay. Drink lots of water, replenish with electrolytes like calcium, magnesium, potassium in supplements, and you'll even be more well hydrated. That's for specifics. Uh, but if you aren't seeing the changes you'd like on a ketogenic diet, it just could be that you're literally just eating too many calories throughout the day. So again, whether it's a nutritionist, dietitian, health doctor, health doctor, health practitioner, get somebody to help you measure the amount of calories that you need and you require to lose the weight. All right, some simple mistakes. A lot of people eat too much protein. Remember, this is not the Atkins diet of the 19, I think, late 80s, 90s. Uh, it is the ketogenic diet, which is relatively high fat, low protein, moderate protein diet. Um, uh, too many calories we mentioned, too many carbs. So many people just estimate their carbs in their head and do well, and then some people are not great estimators, and they wind up having more than 100 grams of carbs for the day, or it could be because of the way you are as a person, your particular metabolism requires you to have less than 50 carbohydrates a day. So you gotta measure and learn where your right sweet spot is. And then I'm gonna mention something here about reintroduction. So I personally don't use a ketogenic diet as a lifestyle long-term. This uh, bout that I'm doing is gonna be a four week Maybe I'll extend it into six weeks. Um, I recommend ketogenic diets for a minimum of four weeks, absolute minimum to even you know, experience some of the benefits. Uh, 12 weeks is a really nice experiment. And if you wanna extend it into six months, a year, two, three years, lifelong, you really want to speak with a health practitioner to make sure it's the right thing for you because long-term, it doesn't make as much sense to me. So what I do is I use it as an elimination, we spoke about that at the beginning, and then reintroducing foods, you can learn a whole lot. So if you're gonna be doing this for four weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, whatever it is, and at the end of the ketogenic lifestyle that you've lived, you just go out and have pizza and ice cream and Chinese food and anything you want, 
and you start to feel bad, well, you're not going to know exactly what affected you and what didn't. So I have something I use called the Leaky Gut Diet Protocol. I've been using it for many years. It's based on the AI Paleo Autoimmune Paleo Diet. I call it the Leaky Gut Diet. If you want that information on how to introduce foods on that, please send me an email, contact me here uh, using the links below and the contact my office, look at my website. I give it away for free. It's easy, ac e easy to access. So I hope you learned a lot from this keto summary, this 30,000 foot view of what really ketosis is and the ketogenic diet is. If I've over explained things, I'm sorry. If I've under explained things, it's because there's so much to explain about every subject, but I really hope that helps. Have a great day.